Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Uh, I want to tell you a story. A wonderful Christian woman named Dorothy was in the midst of teaching five-year-old children, as she usually did, in Sunday school at her church one Sunday morning. Now, during one of her Sunday school lessons, she was telling the kids, the five-year-old kids, about this ancient temple in Jerusalem. She explained to these children that when the temple was finished, that the presence of the Lord filled that huge temple. Dorothy then noticed that as soon as she said that, the eyes of each child there grew wide with excitement. Ooh. Can you imagine the presence of the Lord, she asked. One young boy raised his hand and yelled out, I would want God's presence for me to be a race car. I want a super action figure from God. Superhero action figure, yelled a girl. The best president I would ever want from God, said another, was a remote control car. Well, Dorothy began to realize that when she talked of the presence of God, her kids were thinking of a whole different collection of presents. When we worship God, as we will talk about today, it is not easy for us humans to feel that God is present with us. We focus on material things. As even the Holy Scriptures acknowledge, God is an invisible presence, and often we must look for God's presence in order to see God's presence. And worship helps us to do that. Worship is one of the five purposes of life that God has decreed for the church and for all Christian individuals. Jesus said in the Great Commission that we are to be baptizing people. That means bringing them into the worshiping community in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yet, all five, yet of all five purposes of the church, I have to tell you, in my view, worship has been over the last 40 or 50 years the most devalued purpose over that time. Devalued. Why is that? You know, when I talk about worship with kids, many of them, even if they come to worship on a regular basis, don't really understand what worship is all about. Going back to the story I just told, kids think only materialistically, and it's hard for them, and hard for many adults too, to understand what the point of worship is. What does worship get you? You're telling me, Pastor, that I'm already saved by grace, so... I don't need to go to worship to get on God's good side and get saved, you know. Thus, pastor, why should I come to, to sing some songs and eat a wafer and hear some guy or gal on a collar, blah, 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 and about something for way too long and hear from a Bible I can read on my own and pray when I can pray on my own and have to put some money in this plate being passed around? Is that time effective, pastor? Is it cost effective? Is it effective at all in this 21st century, in this busy world? Okay, let's reset this. First, I want to say that worship in the largest sense is putting your whole life in God's hands. As Paul explains in Romans 12, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And that's your spiritual worship of God. Now, in order to truly worship God, Paul recommends in that same passage that we cut out worldly things and attitudes in our life. Do not be conformed, he said to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Now, one of the best places to be transformed by Christ is in worship, as you are here and online. But back to cutting out worldly things. My gardening friend, who I've been telling you these last several sermons, is helping me explain how to flower our faith this Easter season, recommends we deadhead old flowers. And I said, what? You deadhead? That sounds gruesome. We deadhead old flowers and get rid of them so that new godly flowers get the energy they need to grow in, their, in our lives. Here's a quote from the... Um, advice. It's a known fact that deadheading your flowers after they bloom will encourage 
your perennial flowers, your perennial flowers, to bloom again. Deadhead early and often. The world loves the deadheaded activities that take a, a lot of space and time in our lives. The world encourages us to waste time and energy upon the things it wastes time and energy upon. As Paul also wrote in an earlier part of Romans, we sinners like to exchange the truth about God, that God is always with us, for a lie, so that we worship and serve the things of this world, worship and serve the creature, rather than the creator. Those of you who get Glenn McDonald's uh, daily devotionals, as I do, may recall that a few weeks ago, Glenn told the story of one Easter Sunday at his church about 20 years ago, when his sermon shocked the congregation by what he announced. He told the people there in the sanctuary that he had just gotten a call late the night before, and Billy Graham and his wife Ruth were going to worship with them that day. Then Glenn said, Beyond attending worship, what the Grahams would like us to do this morning is, is to arrange an opportunity to be in dialogue with a number of us. We have chosen this Easter day to free up a few of our rooms here. They had a big church. It's over in, in Zionsville. Where we can gather a high number of you. The Grahams will be available for at least 45 minutes after our final worship service. He continued in his devotion. Glenn said, now I know, I'm sorry, he told the church, now I know that a number of you already have made plans for this Easter day, but clearly it would be enriching to spend even a moment with a man, Mr. Graham, who has made such a remarkable impact on the world. If you're able to join us, he continued, we will do everything we can to open the doors for anyone who is interested in being part of this special opportunity. Glenn next tells us what happened. The excitement in the sanctuary was palpable. We were going to meet someone of great importance. He explained that he went on to say to everyone there, you know, I've been thinking about what I should say if I have the chance to shake Billy Graham's hand this morning. I think I would say, I am so sorry that on Easter of all days, Dr. Graham, I used your good name as the centerpiece of a story designed to fool my congregation. He added, that's right. I haven't the faintest idea where Billy Graham is going to be today. <laughs> Though, of course, not all were happy with Glenn at that moment, especially one man who had moved out of the sanctuary and was on his cell phone changing his whole Easter arrangements with his family while Glenn confessed. Even, even with that, Glenn had made his point. He went on to his congregation that day. But just for a moment, weren't you incredibly excited? Weren't you sitting here imagining yourself in the presence of a noteworthy person a noteworthy person who really wanted to hear from you and who had actually asked you to spend some time with you? The good news, Glenn concluded, is that there really is such a person here today. Because of Easter, we know that he is always available. His name is Jesus. My gardener friend says that another thing plants need in order to grow and flower is a slow, steady supply of nutrients. Reading that, it reminded me of the old saying, slow and steady wins the race. It is the slow and steady worshiping of God every week and in special midweek services that really does help all of us over time grow our faith and flower out our understanding of our divine destiny. You see, every Sunday we can experience as nutrients Parts of our worship experience that feed our souls, fill our hearts, strengthen our spirits. We are fed, first and foremost, by being in the presence of Jesus, as Glenn said. Though it is certainly true that God and Jesus and the Spirit are always with us wherever we are in this world, we do not always receive the clear message of the gospel in other areas of our life. 
But at worship, we receive the clear-cut message, the clear-cut message that God is for us and not against us. For Luther, the God out there, the God out there sometimes seems cruel and unkind. And that can form a kind of wide gulf between God and us. But the God in here in, is a God who in worship and in Bible study wants to reach out beyond that gulf to let us know that God is here to guide us and bless us through God's word and God's promise. As one writer stated, the problem of worship hinges on the question, who is the God who speaks to us? Luther's answer, this person wrote, is determined by the fact that Luther sees God as the one who acts for us. That he is our God on account of his many deeds for us. Just as God proved himself to be the God of Israel by the parting of the Red Sea and the Exodus and other mighty signs, so has God acted for you and me by sending Christ into the world. Christ, as we know, died and rose for us. He is our God. For God still acts for us in baptism, in the Word, and in the Lord's Supper. And as we read today in the book of Revelation, a great multitude, no one could count, will one day worship Jesus with palm branches in their hands and yell, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. We too, like those in heaven, praise the God who has given us salvation. Why? Because we have already received it. As in eternity, we worshipers have already washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And for this reason, we are already before the throne of God. Knowing one day we will worship God without any need of sleep, as it says, day and night. A telling phrase is found today in this passage of the Revelation. That the Lamb, Jesus, will be our shepherd still. Who even in eternity will guide us to the water of life. It sounds like the Lord is my shepherd from the 23rd Psalm. Coming to worship every Sunday is like receiving the water of life to strengthen you for each week ahead. In our gospel today, Jesus tells his opponents, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. We, the Lord's sheep, hear our shepherd's voice every week in worship. We need to hear it. Otherwise, in our flesh, we forget it. I forget it. We really need it. We need to be constantly reminded. We need to be reminded, for instance, of what Jesus also says to us today, that I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them, that's you and me, out of my hand. No one. Once, when Luther was giving a sermon on Mary and Martha, you know that story, he noted how Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to Jesus. He said, Luther said, that is the one thing that is needful for all of us, to sit at the Lord's feet and listen to Jesus. This is the best part to choose, and it shall not be taken away from us. It is an eternal word. My friends, let the public worship of your Savior not be taken away from you by your own choice, week by week. Please. You need to be with God in a special way, the special way of worship, in the singing, the praying, the communing, the baptizing, the gathering in love, just as much as I do. You need to meet with your Master and Savior as much as I do. What a privilege it is to be with Jesus, to proclaim his worship, which means worthyship, that he alone is worthy and on a regular basis. A mother's love works the same way. A mother's love is always there for us on a regular basis. 
Just as you would never forget to send a Mother's Day card to your mother or call your mom today, in the same way you would never forget to be with your Jesus, would you? Our faith flowers ever more beautifully because of the way that worshiping with God develops us. In worship, my friends, our spirit is empowered to overcome our flesh every week. Our spirit connects to the Holy Spirit of Jesus every week. As Glenn MacDonald has written, in a celebrity-driven culture, a visit from Billy Graham would indeed have been a big deal. What's amazing is that if the core Easter message of the resurrection is actually true, if indeed Jesus is not dead but alive, Glenn concludes, the most important figure in human history is always available to every one of us. Jesus invites us to open our eyes, to alter our plans, to do whatever it takes to spend priceless moments with him. Yes, Glenn, you're right. Priceless moments with Jesus and priceless moments with the gathered body of Christ. Amen.